welcome to Southwold, a beautiful seaside town on the coast of Suffolk in the east of England. It's home to one of the most important and most historic breweries in the UK. But they're not just that, they're also incredibly innovative, one of the most sustainable, one of the most exciting, and indeed a brewery that is forging a future for Carscale here in the UK. We're going to be talking about the future of hops, the future of cask, the local malts that they use and the incredible sustainability programs they have in place. This is Adnams and we are in Adnams country. Welcome to the brewery. It's a small space, isn't it? They've done very well with getting everything in to the, into the town. Yeah. Uh, the brew stream actually went in in 2007 and the tanks were so big they had to get lifted in and they were coming down the road and there wasn't much, there wasn't much margin for error. And that's come through the, through come the roof? Come through the roof and the wow. roof was put on afterwards, so yeah. They're like a doll's house, lifted up the roof. Yeah. So yeah, this all went in 2007. It was a, well, it was a very old brew house. So um, it needed a bit of love. So like Victorian, like these buildings. Yeah. Um, right. There was two old mash tuns and they were made out of cast iron and they were flaking oh. and oh they, were, they were quite thin. And when we were putting the brew house in, it was kind of on the back of the Raiden distribution center. So sustainability was really in the mind of the senior management. So and you won awards for that distribution centre, right? Yeah, and it's still very relevant today. Yeah. So, yeah, amazing, I, I really. I read on Wikipedia, it's the biggest living roof in the UK. <laughs> kind of research I do for you people. <laughs> um, so it's the same reason it was a big thing in building this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, very water efficient. Um, we'll come to the energy when we look at the kettle. Um, the yeah, so, so it's a dry brewery. So you sh no drains, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually when you, you, you need special boots and you're yeah. wading around here, it's everything is completely contained within the vessels. Yeah, yeah. and um, part of the water savings are we use rinse water to push the brew to the next vessel, but that water, uh, rather than going to drain, it becomes part of the brew, so you don't Great. waste any water. So amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and how much beer? Well, how much wort are you are you producing through the brew house? Five hundred hex. Right. 300 barrels. Okay. When I think when I first started Adnams in 2011, uh, Bottle Broadside was maxing out on the, on the malt and uh, we've sort of over time managed to make it a bit more efficient. Um, right, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that pushes the brew house to its limit, even though it's a smaller brew length, um, there's a lot of malt, right. yeah, yeah. seven yeah. tons. So, wow. yeah. So it's quite a, I guess, a modern process you're using when it's pretty much all cask that you, you guys make? Um, well, it's changed over time, but certainly when the brew house went in, we were predominantly a cask ale brewery. But yeah, it's not what you would traditionally brew cask ale on, yeah. particularly in 2007. Um, we actually ran the two brew houses simultaneously, so the old brew house and the new brew house. And when they finally got sort of satisfied with the flavour matching, they turned the old one off, so. Where, where was the old one at this point? Uh, well, this used to be an old fermentation room. The old brew house is where the distillery is now, or right, part okay. of it was, yeah. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. 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 Huh. So, so you, you were literally flavour matching, you were getting big differences between like the old Victorian kit and this one, and you had to tweak your processes. Yeah, to... I mean, even, uh, even a similar brewery with the exact same kit, you go and brew on there and the same recipe won't taste the same, so yeah. there's always these nuances and stuff to tweak. So yeah. 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 So this big arm coming off here uh, is energy recovery. Um, so the steam, actually, when we went on to the new brew house, people complained that Southwold didn't smell quite the same. Um, 
Some people complained. Some people said it was better. Yeah. It depends, depends on what side That's of the, the fence. the best smell in the world. I'd yeah, have, I'd, I I'd have been sending good. you a strongly yeah. worded letter. Yeah. <laughs> so we essentially steal the smell and uh, <laughs> we, 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 we store the energy from that steam and we reintroduce it when we run from this buffer tank into the kettle. So typically going from 76 degrees to 93. So, and that's 30% of our gas usage here. So right. massive savings. Yeah, um, super, super. And the condensed water, the steam, it'll be, uh, have lots of volatiles. So your DMS precursors and all of that. So you don't really want to add it into a brew. Yeah, back in, yeah. Um, so we use it for rinsing and stuff like that. So. Uh, we save a lot of uh, a lot of water that way as well. So yeah, yeah it's very very efficient. So, yeah. yeah, and then and then we have the so it's a kettle slash whirlpool. So you're yeah. doing both in here. I mean, if we'd had enough room, we might have had a separate whirlpool. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we moved on to type 90 hops, so pelleted hops, um, way before the brew house anyway. So right, uh, okay. in the so 90, very early. yeah, in the mid 90s, went from whole hops to type 90. So right. um, it was less of a less of a jump on that side anyway, so, yeah. 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 Well, it's incredibly impressive, but I know that you've got some secrets up your sleeve, maybe some more traditional looking things in the fermentation cellar. Oh yeah, the, we're, we, as brewers, we, uh, we're only really making yeast food and uh, we don't really <laughs> call ourselves uh, brewers, we're really just yeast farmers. So yeah. we'll go to the fermentation room because that's actually, the yeast does most of the work really. Boxes of citra. Yes, we do go through uh, <laughs> quite a lot of citra. These I can days. imagine you do now. Yeah. You can see how deep the vessels are. Yeah. Yeah, so like two stories yeah. of, of fermentation space. This is really where uh, all the magic happens, really. Um, works transferred into. <laughs> it's literally magic, isn't it? Yeah. Um, transformed into beer. Um, We've got quite an interesting history of our yeast. So um, we started using this uh, culture in the 1920s and it was acquired from a brewery in Norwich called Morgan's Brewery. I suspect it's a Whitbread B strain originally, um, but the brewery got bombed in the Second World War. So Morgan's or? Morgan's, Morgan's. did, yeah. So um, we used to sort of occasionally go back to collect more yeast from there. So after that point, we were sort of left to um, you know, look after this this culture, right. and it would have evolved over the time to sort of our brewery. So it's very much our house yeast now. Um, we have it stored in a yeast bank in uh, at BRI in case you're bombed. Or, in case we're yeah, bombed, yeah. And uh, we have it sent like twice a year to us, and we make slopes and, cu and culture from that. And uh, yeah, but. It, we, our yeast is kind of like family to us. It, you know, it's uh, you just can't. An employee, you don't pay very well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it has plenty of sugar. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah, it's got gnarly old teeth though. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what, what's special about this yeast? Because it, it, it's more than one strain, right? It's mixed culture. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, you said culture at the start, which yeah. is uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, what, what do we know about those cultures? What are they kind of? Sorry, those strains. What are they bringing? Um, so. Our, our, our yeast is very versatile, um, you know, we can brew very good bit beers to, you know, traditional bitters um, and it's then like some changing of, temperatures and pitching rates and exactly. you can get all kinds of character out. Yeah, and right. then things like broadside and tally-ho, um, if you give our yeast the environment where I say you can let it rip, then it really is brilliant, you know, lots of lovely esters, it's a really high ester producing yeast. Yeah. So. Broadside's an incredibly fruity, yeah. fruity beer, and I guess, you know, yeah. malt's giving some of that, hops giving some of that, but... Yeah, no, it's really the yeast, yeah. yeah. So, no, it's, uh, it, can be, it can be painful, so it's like family, you know, you have to really, <laughs> you do have to really nurture it, but it is totally worth it. I don't know what it. you're talking about. Obviously, the brew house is quite uh, automated, but, here, you know, the, the operators are still in tune with the yeast, you know, visual, um, looking at the yeast head, um, still taking, you know, gravities by hand. You're really part of the process and, you know, it's uh, part of the craft, really. I get because, you know, you, since, since this brew house was, the brew house was put in, you've released Ghost Ship and other stuff that must have massively yeah. increased the demand for your beers. Yeah. Is there the possibility for items to grow? Is there the, the need? Um, I think we've always said we're a 100,000 barrel brewery, I think, that's what we say we are. Um, and the sort of, the, the capacity really depends on the blend of beers that you're 
that you're brewing. Right. So it's kind of a hard what thing it's to calculate. Some are quicker, slower, more efficient, yeah. less efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I still love Adnams Bitter in cask, so I'd like to see that have a bit of a revival. Yeah, yeah. which I guess would be a quicker beer and... Uh, maybe. Uh, it's, it's not dry hopped in the FV, so a lot of the flavour is driven by the dry hop in the cask still. So right. um, it's not necessarily a capacity thing, just I would like to see it on the bar. And yeah, yeah. Um, It's very nice, though, that it kind of... Ghost Ship has grown, Bitter has kind of plateaued, but the, the pubs that really take it now are um, really loyalist and, you know, and they look after it. And they look after it and they've been drinking that beer for a long time. So we're just custodians of that beer, really. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm led to believe this street isn't the beautiful little Fisherman's Cottage street. It well, it like. is still beautiful. Sorry, it is still beautiful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just that this side is not Fisherman's Cottages anymore, so, <laughs> yeah. In the 1980s, uh, as car scale started to make a bit of a resurgence, um, we had to upgrade our racking. So it used to be in the cellar as most breweries were gravity fed back in the day. Yeah. Um, but we needed a new place for the racking line, so it, all the fishing cottages were stripped out behind them. Uh, the wow, front just left. like knocked all through. Yeah, and now, as you can see, there's part of the racking line here. Oh, wow. So. That is the racking line just in there with cars going by. Yeah. So we talk about sustainability as a brewery, but it also means, you know, for us, um, you know, looking after our neighbours as well. So, um, as you can see, the, all the brewery is well disguised. Um, yeah. And just trying to make sure that we, you know, we, we sort of live in harmony with, you know, our next door neighbours. It's remarkable. Yeah. I guess you, the brewery must have had a huge impact on the town, but it's not a, a physical impact, is it? It's, no. It's really well hidden. Yeah. You could, you could go on holiday here and not realise there's a brewery right yeah. in the centre of town until you tried to post something through this letterbox. Yeah, I'd say the, <laughs> uh, the paper delivery, um, yeah, we had a lot of leaflets, so, yeah. <laughs> Just a sealed off door. <laughs> You're just standing there doing the racking and there's just yeah. two for one pizzas come through the door. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Have a little pee. It's all finished with a bang, so it was time to head to the place that serves the best beer in Southwold, the Nelson. Not only were we greeted by a view of the sea and some frothy pints, but also Adnam's brewmaster Fergus, who gave us a fascinating history of the brewery, as well as a lesson in what brewing is really about. Fergus, thank you so much for having us. It, I've been to Southwold so many times and never toured the brewery, so that's really? very exciting. That's very rude. But it's, I, I apologise. But it's also very exciting to chat to the creator of many of my favourite beers. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but I think we should start by going through the history of Adams, because I'm yep. not sure everyone belie uh, believes, maybe they won't believe, but understands how far back it, it goes. All right, so quick history. Uh, so the earliest record we have of brewing in Southwold is from 1345. Uh, so wow. someone called Joanna de Corby uh, was being prosecuted for breaking the ace size of ale, uh, which would basically mean she was probably diluting the beer. Um, so it's not the most uh, prestigious record of brewing, but that's our earliest record. <laughs> A tradition that's carried on to this day. <laughs> <laughs> we do add water to some beer. Uh, but so then the sort of the South or the Sobe Brewery, uh, which eventually also becomes Adams, but the Sobe Brewery, it, we've got records on, on the current site to 1660. Um, it went through a series of hands uh, until it was sort of bought by the Adams brothers in 1872. So George and Ernest Adams arrived in Southwell. They sort of came from a brewing background. Uh, so their uncle owned a brewery in Reading. And Ad the first Adams brewery was in, was in Reading in Newbury, actually. Right. Um, so they, they, they sort of were farmers and then they came up here, bought this brewery, funded a little bit by, uh, by their uncle. Uh, but then George got tired of life in Southwold and then emigrated to South Africa and got, got eaten, eaten. By, a, by a crocodile, although yeah. it's not true at all. Oh. Thank you very much. Not true at all. Not well, a little bit. it might be true a little bit, and but we have bought a giant 
blue crocodile for the tourist centre. Yeah, so, we, we met him. So okay. it is entirely true now, entirely true. Right. He did die in the Zambezi River, I've been told. Yes, that's right. And he may have got eaten by a crocodile. I don't know that he, it was the cause of the death, really. So the, the family line went down to the other brothers. <laughs> yes, yes. Progeny. That's, that's the important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> that's right. So that's a very quick brewing history of, uh, of Southwark. So where do you come into the history of Adnan? And much later on. Right, okay. Later on. <laughs> I wasn't accusatory, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I joined in 2004. Uh, so I'd, I'd done a bit of brewing at Fuller's, uh, was there for about seven years and then moved up to, to Adnan's. Um, really exciting time for the brewery. So we had you know, really old Victorian kits. So we had old Victorian mash tuns which were made of cast iron and were chipping away. And you'd see little bits of cast iron floating in the mash tun which is not really ideal. Uh, and we had two old copper kettles, which were sort of falling to bits, really. The, they had the thinness of the copper was sort of non-existent in some places, which is not great for a vessel you're boiling something in. Yeah, you want no, no holes. No, you, you want a small number of holes. Right, sorry, you want, yeah, But you so want to know where they are. Correct holes. <laughs> yeah. You want the holes in the right places where you put the things in. That's that generally rude for life. That was literally but, uh, just worn away over time. Yeah, yeah, so He's, copper dissolves over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually, the, it was really being held together by the sort of wooden cladding on the outside. Um, so the decision was made way before I joined that they needed to reinvest, which was actually quite a big deal. So lots of old regional breweries were actually divesting away from brewing. They were mm. putting all the money into pubs, uh, letting the brewery run down. So actually to invest back in was phenomenal. That was, a, that was really stepping outside where all, all the other traditional breweries at the time were really going. Uh, Jonathan Adams really drove it, I guess, um, really, and he was, he's always been really keen that we make stuff, and I think that, that's fundamentally what Adams has tried to do over the last sort of 10, 15 years, make sure we're ready to make stuff for the next 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. And you were running both kits at the same time for a bit while we you did. fed it in the Like, like any sensible brewery, you never tell people when you've changed. Right. Until, until well after you've actually changed. <laughs> so we ran, we ran both breweries together for about six months, I guess. Um, so we had a big sort of snake of, of pipes through the, of sort of hoses through the brewery, connecting one bit to another one. Uh, but we kept brewing on the old kit and added, added brews in from the new kit as we were happy with them. Um, and then we ran that like that for about six months. And then we told people, that, then we turned the other one off and told people, actually, you've been drinking the new beer for about six months now. Right. And they said, I mean, well, it's changed. I knew it. <laughs> It's like a new Coke or something. Exactly like that. Exactly like that. W would that have been a sensible decision had a beer like Ghost Ship not come along? How, how well, big a change was that for you guys? So, so I think if, when we built the brew house, it was really designed around bitter and broad, broadside. So Southwell Bitter and Broadside were the mainstays of what we did back then. We probably brewed, you know, 90% of what we brewed was probably those two beers. Mm -hmm. uh, so the brew house was really designed around that. So it wasn't really designed with the idea that we would be able to produce lots of new things, but it was brewed or designed around the idea that we needed to be able to, because we don't know where, where, you know, where markets go. We don't know what people's tastes are going to be like in 10, 20, 30 years time. We just need to be flexible enough to do stuff. Uh, and so the brew house was designed around being flexible and not just about taste, but also about, about where our grain comes from. So we only buy barley from Suffolk and Norfolk. Um, it's grown here, it's malted here. It's some of the best quality we're going to get anywhere in the yep. world. But we always want to buy, be able to buy that. But as climate changes, actually, it might not always be the best quality. Sometimes we'll have to say we're still going to buy it locally, but we'll have to do different things to make it work for us. So the old brewers wouldn't be able to handle that. The new brewers can. So it was some of that, some of that sort of long-term thinking, I guess, which you get with the sort of company like Adams, which, which has been here a long time already and sort of wants to be here even longer. Mm -hmm. So where did Ghost Ship come from? So that that was that twenty. 10? 2010, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I guess there's a couple of bits of the story, I guess. Uh, so it was, it's driven by Citra. I think the, the whole beer relies on the fact we, so Garrett Oliver and a couple of the sort of brewing merchants from the US were over in uh, Mark Dorber's pub across in, in Warberswick, uh, the Anchor. Uh, obviously Mark Dorber, if you know Mark Dorber, knows everyone in, in the craft brewing industry in the US. So they were over visiting Mark. Mark invited us over um, to have a chat, talk, have a few beers. Uh, and they started talking about this new hop that had just come out called Citra. Um, and, and they said, you, you have to try it. It's, it's, it's so different. And so we did. We got, as soon as we got a chance, we got some in and tried it. And it was so different from the other hops at the time. And I think we've sort of, it gets lost in the sort of history a little bit, but it, it had such a different profile to anything else that was really out there. And so we said, we have to use this in the next chance we have. Uh, and so the next chance we had was really around developing a sort of Halloween beer, which, you know, we, we didn't have a Halloween beer. We thought and it, was, it was just a suggestion that we should, we should have a Halloween beer, have a seasonal beer for that period of time. Um, and it just so happened one of the other pubs in Southwell, the Red Line, 
at this old um, cabinet of old Adam's beers. Um, and one of the beers in there was called Deathly Pale Ale. Uh, sort of skull and crossbones, pale beige label. Um, yeah, you thought, what, what is that? So the history of that beer was it was a beer brewed in 1975 um, to celebrate the bicentenary of something because there is no bicentenary. Uh, it was about it was about it was a few years late. It was about <laughs> three years late. But anyway, um, but the history of the beer was they designed the beer. It was a sort of high pale ale, sort of seven, eight percent pale ale, uh, but it was brewed to celebrate this non-existent bicentenary. Um, but then um, I think everyone had sort of designed, seen this label with a skull and crossbones on it, uh, Deathly Pale Ale, very weird name for, for Adams for, for a start, but also a weird name for the time. Um, but they printed the labels, but before they actually bottled it, someone turned around and said, that's the symbol for poison, isn't it? Ah, let's not do that. Ah, uh, right. Uh, yeah. so, so very quickly they called it Centenary Pale Ale and changed the <laughs> image. Uh, but this, these labels had still got out and some hand label bottles were still around. So we thought, Deathly Pale Ale, that's a great name for a Halloween beer. Why don't we do that? Um, so we decided we'd brew this citra-led beer. Um, we'd added a bit of rye in because we quite like the nutty flavour of sort of, particularly sort of crystal rye has that slight nutty toffee note to it. And we thought we'd just add a bit more balance to the beer. Uh, but it was really all driven by citra. <laughs> So we went along the same path, designed this beer, Deathly Pale Ale, uh, was going to come out for Halloween, and then we thought, actually, that's not, no, let's not do that. It's a skull and crossbones. And it might imply, <laughs> you know, deathly, I don't want death <laughs> do you know? on anything I consume, do you know? generally. Well, the other side of death. Well, <laughs> other people agreed with you right, and decided, okay. let's not call it that, and so the name Ghost Ships was sort of developed around, around the sort of ghost stories up and down the street. Are there a lot of ship, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, so yeah. there's shipwrecks. And... Yes, there's lots of shipwrecks, um, and... Uh, particularly around sort of the stories around Warburswick, just across the coast, so, right. just across the estuary. Sorry, yeah. so that was where that was where the name Ghost Ship eventually came from. Uh -huh. um, and it was just a one-off seasonal, as as these things tend to be. Uh, but it's sort of so faster than any other seasonal we'd ever done before. Um, we, I think we ran out a little early, but not too bad. Uh, but then the following year we said, oh, that went really well. Let's let's bring it back for Halloween again. Uh, and this time it ran out about a month beforehand. Right. But that was as much citrus as I could get hold of. That was it, really. Adams have been so focused on cask. You know, you reinvested in the brewery when other cask breweries were focusing on hotels and pubs and yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. How how have you sort of ridden... Because, you know, cask is going through a bit of a decline again now. Yeah. What's that look like to, to Adams? Have you continued to grow? Have you continued to reinvest? Have you been successful through that? Uh, so I guess uh, we, we've seen the same decline on cask. I think that that's probably universal across most breweries, I guess, now. Uh, but we then haven't been primarily a cask brewery, brewery up until, I guess, 2016, 17. We actually re invested again in building the second half of a brewery, the sort of conditioning, the filtration, the kegging side. So we did that um, to try and, again, to give us a bit more flexibility in, in where markets go. Because, yeah. again, what we're trying to do is make sure that we are here for the long term. So taking that, I don't know, it's a bit, bit cliche now, but that's sustainability in the sort of broader sense. It's not just about environmental, it's also about actually this business being here and contributing for a long yeah, time. Yeah, jobs and... Yeah, and all that stuff. So actually stuff, yeah. being able to produce some keg beer on site is not, it doesn't take away from the cask, it just adds to it. Um, but cask is still very much central to what we do. And I think that's what most people will know us for, I guess. Um, so, but it is going through a challenging time. Um, for lots of reasons, we won't talk about pandemics or the rest of it, but lots, lots of reasons that have broken people's habits. Um, but I think one of the things we, we're really keen on is that, is that the pub is central to this and cask beer is central to that. Um, so we want people back in pubs, we want people drinking cask beer at, at its best. And I think that's where we all have to work a bit harder to make sure it's always being served at its best. Um, I would love to try some broadside and yep, some bitter brilliant. because we've talked about Ghost Ship. Yep. It's one of my favourite modern kind of cask ales. But I grew up drinking broadside. Did you? Yeah, when I worked in a pub, I think it was a Green King pub. Yeah. So it must have been a guest line or something. Good God. I used to drink, used to drink yeah. a lot of broadside. So brilliant. I want to get back on that wagon. Yeah. Let's get some broadside. So we have broadside in front of us, yes. which I gather we're, we're a bit late. This celebrated its 50th, 50th birthday yeah. last year. Yeah. So. It's an interesting beer because A, it's different in cask and in bottle. It's quite different, yeah. And B, it's not, I mean, I get, it's not really an ESB. Is it a, a no. strong ale? What? No, we've never really brewed things to style. If we're honest. <laughs> right, okay. We brew things and go, what style was that? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's close to that. I'll do that. Uh, so, so, Broadside was originally brewed to celebrate the tricentenary of the Battle of So Bay, which you'll, you'll, have, you'll have learnt about, I'm sure. What, in school or...? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember 1672, that one. Okay. A couple of Dutch 
some Dutch lads turned up. Some Dutch lads <laughs> turned up in some boats, big boats, uh, and some English lads went going, oi, oh. oi. Were they, were they sent packing by the Nor Norfolk and Suffolk? Well, it was, I think the story was they were all, the sailors were all in the pubs around Southwell, had to go and haul, haul ass, I think, onto the ships. Oh, half cut. Yeah, uh, half cut. As they normally were, I think it was a, it wasn't a, nothing unusual. No. Uh, and then uh, they had a bit of a had a bit of a word, um, and then they decided it was a draw. I think was really was right. It? Okay. Yeah. So the bottle version came out in 1972, and it was to celebrate this tricentenary of the Battle of Sill Bay. Um, strong dark ale. I think it might have been slightly lighter than this, but strong dark ale. Um, and again, it was sort of brewed as a one-off celebration, but it became this really popular sort of local bottled beer. So they kept doing it. I think originally it did start in, in cask, but a 6.3%, uh, which is what the bottle is, um, version of, of this, wasn't going to sell a huge amount in cask. No. So come the sort of mid 80s, they decided they needed another cask beer. Um, so they reformulated Broadside to be this 4.7% beer, similar flavors, fruit cake, all the rest of it, uh, but obviously a very different recipe to the 6.3% version. Yeah. Um, but so they wanted this to be a bit more coughable, uh, but still have that have that sort of sort of depth of flavor to it. Um, it it's even at 4.7, and it's definitely there in the bottle. It has what I think is a slight, and as uh, Malt Miller found out in their video review, a slight Belgian yeah. kind of character to it. It has just that little hint of like. A Belgian double, too. Yeah, Just good. A, a little lovely phenolic yeah. fruitiness. And it's something we've only really started calling. So we've always said it's it has a slight Belgian-y flavour to it, but that, that phenolic note, I think, is something we've only started really calling out in the last few years. Right. And that is what gives Adams most of its character, I think. I think, yeah, we've got... You can you can you can do lots of things around malt and hops, but and water. But actually, the thing that drives Adams' flavour and the house character is that Adams yeast, um, and I think that comes through comes through differently in different beers, and it depends on if we encourage it to show a little bit or not. Yeah. Um, so we try and play with temp like everyone does. We play with temperatures and uh, and times and everything else about whether we want that character to show through. Um, it, it's interesting because on the tour, Dan described your yeast as as very versatile and. Yeah. The home brewer, me, and probably the, the drinkers out there mostly thought, oh, well, that means you know it can it can go to strong temp uh, strong go mm. to high temperatures, go to strong strengths, mm. you know, works in a table beer or in an imperial style. But what he actually meant was, it's no, really, like it can really create a Belgian character, <laughs> or, yeah, that, or in ghost ship it can play you know quite a quiet part yeah. and let the citrus sing, yeah. while still adding almost a kind of rose watery yeah. subtle kind of thing underneath. So it's just. You know, it works across so many different styles and creates different flavors. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be the star of the show. It can play a more subtle role. Yeah. But there are some beers where we, we know even the subtle role is too much, so we, we, we swap in some other yeast. But 99% but of what we brew is probably is probably with Adam's yeast because we do like we like that sense of place as much as anything. Yeah. We don't, we don't like... We don't like... Well, we don't want to be able to brew the same beer here as, as in 20 other places around the world. We want to be able to say this beer is brewed here and, and really only here. Yeah. Um, we like that. And, and same for the water profile. We don't try and mess around with our water too much because actually we don't, we don't want to strip it down to reverse osmosis and then take it back up again because we want, we want the, local, the local sort of environment to have a say in what, what things taste like. Which is where the point difference is going to, particularly in Carscale, I think, where we're all using English malts, English yeah. hops. You know your yeast and your local water are a way of going. This is yeah, absolutely. This is us, um, and with everybody using very modern equipment as well, I guess that's yeah. I think, the process. I think the it. danger is everyone ends up producing exactly the same thing, yeah. and, then, and then you're only fighting over who's got the biggest marketing budget to spend. Do you, do you think that um, having a brewery founded such a long time ago yeah. makes you think about time in a different way to a lot of modern breweries where they're maybe a bit short-sighted. Like everything you're telling me is all about the future, planning yeah. for the future and making sure you're going to be here in another 100 years. I don't, but generally, that's what people think here. Um, so when I first joined, a long, long time ago, mm. uh, people said people only come here to retire because people stay for the duration. They don't, they don't move on, they stay. Uh, stay for the duration is a, is a tag phrase for another brewery. It Very is, good. yeah, not too far away. <laughs> not yeah. too far away. <laughs> but, but generally, that's what people were trying to do. So everything we do is really about making sure it is here for the long term. And that is, part, that is partly that heritage already, that we, you know, we, we do want to continue that on. But most people here are, are custodians of the brewery. They're not, it's not our brewery. The, these beers aren't our beers. They're the, they're, they're the people who drink them. Um, even Ghost Ship isn't really our beer anymore. It's, it belongs to the people who drink Ghost Ship. Um, at some point, that, that that moves away from being your beer to someone else's. Mm. 
So our, our, certainly our, our job is to... In 50 years' time, there's going to be somebody yeah. looking back and going, yeah, this isn't our beer. We, yeah. We're a custodian after Fergus and his team. Exactly that. So our, our job is to make sure that they get that beer yeah. the way they expect to get it. And then if you want, and so obviously trends change and tastes change, but, but there's a very recent example in the US where they've changed the recipe of a very old beer. Well, relative, yeah, in relative terms, yeah. old beer. But I think that, for me, I, and I, understand, I totally understand the reasons they've done it, but it, that, that is taking that beer away from the people who, who own it, really. And it's not the brewery that owns it, it's the people who drink it. Right now. There are plenty of breweries out there making special beer, but few that are special themselves, and Adnams is one of them. Historic but innovative, ambitious but sustainable, and wholly committed to British brewing's longevity. Finding a word for how we felt after falling completely in love with Adnams and Southwold is tricky, but as usual, Brad's got one to try out. Johnny, I'm, I'm absolutely flabbergasted. We've come to a place I expected to be just sort of heaped in tradition and, and kind of maybe a little bit fusty, a little bit dusty. But they're, if anything, they're one of the most innovative breweries I've been to in recent memory. Yeah. They're not, I mean, it's such a historic place, but they're so forward thinking. It is like you look at the exterior of the brewery and you're like, this is this yeah. is traditional, this is old school, this is history, and then you step through through like a, a fake row of cottages and suddenly you're in this incredibly modern brew house with a very modern outlook. Yeah, I feel like they, you know, in this in this beautiful town of Selfold, they have they 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 don't sit heavy. They're kind of like a light entity within the town. They're, they're quite respectful, well, very respectful of their place, and I think you can tell they love where they're from and that you can taste that in the beer you can see that in their sort of philosophy of everything they do from the top down you know from their warehouse with the biggest green roof in the country that they did you know why why did they do that they didn't have to do that it's innovative it's expensive mm -hmm. but it's also the right thing to do yeah. and that's kind of like we should all be thinking long term into the future how can we leave the world how can we leave the thing that we love in a better condition than when we first found it or when we first became custodians of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And that, that sense of place that you talked about is also incredibly important. So they, you know, they're, they're definitely a part of this community and are driving it forward as well. You know, this should be a very seasonal town, but I think Adnams are part of the reason why Southwold thrives all year round. But also that sense of place is important from the fact, you know, they're right by the grain. They use their own water because that creates its own unique flavours in their beer. They use their own yeast because that creates its own sense of place. And, you know, when I was drinking the broadside there with, with Fergus, it was, you know, something that I'd always loved about broadside really crystallised. And it was that slightly Belgian Westmile double yeah. kind of character that I didn't know what Westmile double was when I was drinking this aged 18. But now I know what it is and that's what I love about it. And it's why Westmile double is one of my favourite beers. And that is entirely unique in the UK in terms of like these big, strong, dark bitters. And they've got that from, from having 150 years of, of heritage. I think it's over 100 year old, that, that yeast crop that they isolated, the sort of mixed yeah, 20s, firm. 20s, you said, yeah. 19, so yeah, possibly, 20s. yeah. Yeah, 100 year old thing that they keep, uh, you know, making the slides of and propagating it out every, I think it's a couple of times a year, they said they kind of regrow it. Um, and it, it, there's, there's something very special about having that that sort of longer history celebrating it but also embracing modernity yeah and moving things forward yeah and the, you know the reason we're going on this mission particularly this year of, of like revisiting classic breweries is because we don't just want to be a channel that says drink this new thing it's also reevaluate these old things as well that's i think a really important message we should make and that's for the the malt the hops cask as a format breweries that make cask and this is, this is why we do it. Breweries like Adnams that show us the real value of going back and, to a brewery that maybe you haven't drunk for it a while and going, I understand why I loved this and I understand why I'm going to keep loving it and why I'm going to keep going back. Um, yeah, a magical place to come, Southwold and Adnams. Uh, and we'll be back. Yeah, I'll sure. drink to that. Cheers, man. Cheers.